Okay. I'm, okay. I'm... So you. Uh, it's recording. Okay. Let okay. me find the definition of the Ricci curvature here. Great. Um, uh, Okay, here is the curvature itself, right? Uh, it's a map from C infinity of E into C infinity of E tensor wedge two of T M dual or C infinity of E tensor wedge two of T M to C infinity of E. Let's see. And then after that, uh, we, we gave the definition of the curvature explicitly, right? It's defined like this. And then the Ricci should be soon after. Um, the Ricci, where's the Ricci? Uh, here's the holonomy, and here we've got again the holonomy. I did the holonomy after the Ricci. Oh, uh, before the Ricci, that's kind of, oh, here's Levi Civita. Oh, yes, of course, yeah, right, right, okay. And, okay, this is again the Levi Civita. So let's see, so let's recall, the Levi Civita is a special connection, right, uh, which is def defined, which is associated uniquely to the metric, and it satisfies, you know, this NABG equal to zero, and it's torsion free. And then um, the curvature of the Levi Civita is like this, right? It, it's, a, it's a one three tensor. And then we composed it with the, right. We, we used little g itself to define a new tensor. It's a zero four tensor, right? We compose the regular, the usual curvature tensor with g tensor, the identity, right? We get something like this. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I have to turn off my camera again because it's creating problems, sorry about that. And then here we have got the, um, I think the Ricci, oh, it's still not here, let's see. Uh, It looks like I didn't define it yesterday. Did I define? I didn't define the Ricci curvature. I thought I did. I was positive I did. Well, I can't find it right now. Maybe I'll just give you the definition again. Sorry about that. I'm not going to stop looking through, looking through the notes for the curvature. I'll just give it to you. Um, Okay, here it is. So the Ricci curvature. Oops, not red. All right, so recall the Ricci curvature. Is is a, it's a zero two tensor defined as um so you define we define it point by point at, at any point x you get a map you have a bilinear map on the tangent space to m at x into the real numbers and you take two tangent vectors and you send them to the trace of a certain linear map so w maps to the curvature uh, okay, I'm out of room here. Let me make this a little bit smaller. So this guy maps to the trace of W maps to the curvature of U W acting on V. Okay, so, so what do we have here? We have, this is a bilinear map on the tangent space, right? So you take two tangent vectors and you send them to the trace of a certain linear map. And what's that linear map? It's the linear map that takes a vector, a tangent vector again, and send it to the curvature at that point, applied to the two vectors u, w, and 
and to the three vectors, I should say, U, W, and V, right? So remember the curvature tensor, you can actually think of it as something acting on triples, right? So this is something, the curvature tensor acts on a triple of vectors. So, and the image is again, another vector. So this R X of U, W, V is another tangent vector, right? So W goes to another tangent vector. That's a linear map from T X of M to T X of M and you take its trace, right? Yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the definition of the Ricci tensor. And if you write, um, if you write um, in, in local coordinates, it's actually kind of easier. If you write the curvature tensor R as the sum of R, A, B, C, D, and then D, D, X, A, D, X, B tensored with dxc wedge dxd. If I write the curvature tensor in terms of coordinates like this, then you can write your Ricci tensor um, so your Ricci tensor will be a sum of what I would call Ricci AB of dxa tensored with dxb uh, where so then this is as you can see, we're going to get exactly the trace. This is going to be the sum of R A A C B. Oh, so no, no, uh, I always do this. Sorry about that. R C A C B, the sum over C. Okay, so you can. It's 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 kind of easy to write down in terms of coordinates. And if you do, if you want to do it coordinate free, you do it the first way that I just described. Okay, uh, sorry, I thought I did this yesterday, but it looks like I did not, actually. I, I think that you didn't. Yeah, yeah, I think I didn't. Yeah, I, I, I thought I did somehow, but Thank you. yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so, so let's see. So we were talking about the Ricci flatness. So we say something is Ricci flat if this Ricci curvature is just zero, right? Uh, and as I, as I mentioned before, you can show that the, that the Ricci curvature is the actually the well the Ricci form. You know, I, I took the curvature and I associated it to the to to the curvature, right? I used the metric, and I associated a one one form to my Ricci curvature. The Ricci curvature itself is actually symmetric; it's not anti-symmetric. So to get something anti-symmetric, you can compose it with the metric. Um, sorry, compose it with a complex structure, right? The complex structure has the virtue that it will turn something symmetric into something anti-symmetric and vice versa. So by putting in the complex structure, I get something anti-symmetric. It turns out it's a one one form. And then it, it, you can show that that is the curvature of the Levi-Civita connection on the canonical bundle of your manifold, right? And then that's how you see that uh, basically if the Ricci curvature is zero, then the canonical bundle is a flat bundle from which it sort of follows it's, it's in fact trivial and you have a cloudy L and the holonomy group is contained in SUM. All right, so that is that is the cloudy L case. And you know, a lot of people have worked on the cloudy L case, but that's not the purpose of our lectures here. So I'm going to switch to the next case, which is the hypercalar case. Okay, so the hypercalar case uh, is based on the quaternions. So let me re remind you what the quaternions look like. So the quaternions are, can be, you can write down a basis for the quaternions like this, R times one plus R times I, R times J, and then R times K, where I squared is is equal to J squared is equal to K squared and is equal to ijk is equal to minus one. They are associative, right? But they're not commutative. And uh, the, you can define the Lie group SVR. So SVR is the group of R linear Uh, endomorphisms uh, 
of h to the power r, so h direct sum with itself, r times preserving a quaternionic uh, Hermitian form. Uh, which here I will denote that by Q. So what do I mean by quaternionic Hermitian form? I mean that it's the same thing as for being complex Hermitian, but it's it with respect to the quaternions. So it satisfies the equation Q of A, V, B, W is equal to A bar B, Q of V, W for all A, B in the quaternions and V and W in H, R. Okay, and this is, uh, and the bar is, um, so if A is uh, lambda plus mu i plus mu j plus rho k, then A bar is what you would imagine, lambda minus A i minus mu j minus rho k. Okay, so this is um, quaternionic Hermitian. And if you have a, an R linear endomorphism that preserves this form, you call that quaternionic Hermitian. And then um, such a Q can be represented by a matrix. By an R by R matrix which I will call A with entries, uh, entries in H such that A times A bar transpose is the identity of H to the R. Okay, and um, so now what you can do is each time you choose, um, each time we choose, sorry. Um, sorry. Yes, go ahead. In the previous page, there is a little typo. Uh, in the previous page, there is a, yeah, uh-huh, where? Uh, uh, a bar is equal to lambda minus mu. Oh yes, of course, yeah, thank you, sorry. You're welcome. Minus mu. Thank you. Okay. Right? Now, each time we choose um, some uh, i in H with square equal to minus one, then we can embed we get an embedding of SPR inside SU2R, okay? And um, here is how we do this. So we complete I to a triple, to, a, to what we call a quaternionic triple. i, j, k as before, right? Which means that i squared, j squared, and k squared, and i, j, k are all equal to minus one, right? So that's the quaternionic triple. We do that. And then uh, we represent uh, multiplication by these guys. Um, on HR by matrices that I will denote just by the capital letters, I, J, K, right? And then you can show that you can write, uh, that you can decompose the matrix A as a sum of some matrix H plus another matrix omega times J, where, uh, where this matrix H is Hermitian 
Now, this is, this is just complex Hermitian with respect to I. And this omega here is anti-symmetric. And it with entries, so the entries of omega are not just uh, arbitrary quaternions, they're actually in some sense complex numbers um, where, you, where you use the complex numbers that are, that are expressed as in terms of little i only. So you have a copy, a copy of the complex numbers inside H uh, you know, by using little i here, right? R plus R times i, that's a copy of the complex numbers and this matrix omega has entries only in that subfield of, of the quaternion. So anti-symmetric with entries only involving I. So any, um, <clears throat> so you do this and then um, you can see that then SP of R can be represented by, um, so a matrix, so a matrix, uh, an R by R matrix, right? With the entries in the quaternions, right? You can show that an R by R matrix belongs to SPR. Well, first of all, by definition, basically, it means that it commutes with A. And then you can show that this, this is equivalent to it commute, commuting with um, with H and omega. Okay, and this is when, uh, and you, so then this will give you the embedding that you want. Uh, if you think of, um, so maybe, maybe that's getting a little bit too complicated, but, but anyway, you can use this sort of, let me not get into any more details because I'm not sure, I'm, I think I'm going a little bit too fast for people to be able to really follow this argument. It's not very complicated, but you know, if you sit by yourself with a, Piece of paper and a pen, you can you can work it out. So you can from this you can get this embedding that I was talking about of SPR into SU2R by thinking of SP, SPR as um, so. Think of uh, I can get your embedding of SPR into SU2R by thinking of. Um, SU2, uh, I mean, um, no, there's no S there. Sorry, let me correct that. So this is U of 2R. By thinking of U of 2R as uh, the group of transformations of uh, HR, commuting with H. The matrix H. All right. Okay. And as I say, if you don't mind, I, I'm not going to get into the details because I'm going a little bit too fast to really uh, make that absorbable in such a quick time. All right. So, um, okay. But why, so why are we doing this? So, so given, so now let's go back to our Riemannian manifolds, right? So we have, we have our quaternions. Uh, you know, we, we went over a little bit of stuff about the quaternions. So now if we have a Riemannian manifold, right? Given a Riemannian manifold. M with holonomy group uh, contained in SPR, we can identify the tangent space to P at M with HR um, to obtain 
a sphere of complex structures. And how, how, what are these complex structures? So, um, so we said that the holonomy group is contained in SPR, and yet, right? And we can naturally think of SPR as a group of automorphisms of HR, right? So that's how we do the identification of the tangent space to M with HR, right? So we have then these, uh, the holonomy group acts on TPM and uh, it, it sort of, it commutes with its action with, with the action of SPR on HR, right? And then, um, so you have, uh, you have this identification and then you can define this sphere of complex structure in the following way. So what are your complex structures? So you write lambda equals A times I plus B times J plus C times K with A squared plus B squared plus C squared equals one. So now you see that your ABC, the pair ABC naturally belongs to the sphere S2, right? Inside R3. They're just, a, they're just a unit sphere, right? S2 inside R3. So that's why we, we talk about a sphere of complex structures, right? And so each time you have a point of the sphere, you get a complex structure like this, which is given as a linear combination of three complex structures, I, J, and K. And what are these complex structures, um, I, J, and K? Um, So you have your, um, what you started out with a, with a manifold, which was a complex manifold, right? So you, you have a given complex structure I, right? And then this, uh, this quaternionic structure allows you to, um, to define these other complex structures. So these basically, so I and J and K are, are obtained from the identification of TPM with uh, h to the r, right? So you have an action of the quaternions on h to the r and you kind of transfer that to TPM. Um, and you, you define, as I said, I'm not doing all the, uh, all the details here, but um, <clears throat> you sort of, you spread the, the complex structures on hr along m, you know, on the tangent spaces to m, right? And then it gives you complex structures on m. And then, um, you can, you can verify that all of these complex structures are what we call constant with respect to the levi civita connection. So we can check that, that nabla applied to lambda is zero for every lambda complex structure as before. Okay. So then what you get is that G is scalar by our definition of scalar. G is scalar with respect to all of these. Complex structures. Okay, so we have a sphere of scalar structures. meaning a sphere of complex structures that are all Kähler, right? On M. Okay, so, um, so you see, so in the Calabial case, uh, the holonomy group was potentially bigger, right? So, um, so let me just make the comparison here. So comparison. Uh, Calabial case. Let me assume that not that whole G is not just uh, contained in SUM, but it's actually equal. So it's uh, actually. Let me do. Sorry. Oops. What happened? Oh, nothing. Okay. All right. The Calabial case was SUM. So if you actually have equality then it means that your holonomy group is not contained in SPR, 
right? It's, it's, it's actually bigger, strictly bigger. So it's equal to SUM. So here you have only one, one a unique complex structure, which is scalar. So unique complex structure. complex scalar structure, right? In the, in the hyperscalar case, so we have that whole G is contained in SPR, right? So we have at least a sphere of complex structures. Okay, that's what we have. And um, in fact, if, uh, so um, here is our, our next definition. So definition is, is that we say that M is irreducible hypercalar. if the whole the holomo the holonomic group is actually equal to spr in such a case there is exactly one sphere of complex structures uh, sorry kähler ones of course one sphere of Kähler complex structures. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, all right. Now, this is the case where at the other extreme, you, have, you also have um, the case where, so the extreme case, If the holonomy is zero, then you can have lots and lots of Kähler complex structures, right? So, more Kähler complex structures. An example of that is the complex torus. So if M is a complex torus, then the holonomy is zero. And, and M has a lot of, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of these Kähler complex structures. Okay, so um, let's see, how much time have I got? Uh, we started at uh, five minutes to 11. So I've got another maybe 15, 17 minutes. Okay, so um, right. So let me now talk about the Decomposition theorem. Okay. That's one of the main things that we're interested in. So, the decomposition theorem. This is for uh, Ricci flat manifolds, okay? So suppose that M is B is a compact, compact complex manifold, which is also Kähler. So what I'm giving myself here, I'm giving myself M, I'm giving myself a complex structure I, and I'm giving on, a, uh, on M also a Riemannian metric G, and I'm assuming that my metric is scalar with respect to this particular complex structure, okay? So 
compact killer, we're going to also assume that it's complete. And we're going to assume that it's Ricci flat. All right. So if we go back to our um, list of uh, holonomy groups, right, we can go back and look at our list of holonomy groups. Where is it? Here it is. So I said it's um, compact, complex, complete, Kähler, and Ricci flat, right? So if you look at the list here, I'm not in the SON case, uh, but I could be in case number two where the holonomy group is U of M, or I could be in the case three where the holonomy group is S U of M. But actually, no, I can't be in case two either because case two is not Ricci flat. Okay, so I cannot be in one or two because one is not Kähler and two is not Ricci flat. So I'm assuming I'm Ricci flat. So I can be in three because in three, I am Kähler and I'm Ricci flat. In four, I'm also Kähler and Ricci flat. In five, I'm not Kähler, right? And then in six and seven, I'm not Kähler. I'm not, um, I'm not Kähler either, right? So then you see that the, the cases, the only possible cases are the holonomy is, the holonomy is SUM, it's, it could be uh, SPR, but of course it could, um, it could also just be zero, right? I mean, if it's a zero, it, it will uh, satisfy what we want. So here's, so here's what, the, what the decomposition te theorem tells you. It tells you basically what you would suspect you know, from, the, from the description of the holonomy groups. If you have a compact killer and rich, complete and richly flat manifold, then these are the, this is what happens to it. So the universal cover, so here we're using also the Durham, the Durham decomposition theorem, right? So the Durham decomposition theorem was for simply connected things, right? So we take the universal cover of M. Then we say that we, we have the, the statement that this is isomorphic to. Now the Durham decomposition gave you a Euclidean space, but this is a complex manifold. So the Euclidean space had better be a comp over the complex numbers. So this is a CK times a product of some manifolds VI and then times a product of some manifolds XJ, right? Where So CK has the standard Kähler metric of you know, just the complex numbers. Um, and for all uh, oh, sorry, no, just I and J. Um, let me just say for all I first. For all I, uh, VI is um, compact, simply connected. With holonomy and of course irreducible because the irreducibility for, follows from the fact that the holonomy is irreducible, right? So with holonomy, SU, MI, right? So these are Calabi-Yau's, the holonomy is SU, MI. And for all J, XJ is compact, simply connected. Again, irreducible in parentheses because that follows from the, from the description of the holonomy. With holonomy, SP of RJ for some RJ, sorry. And that should have been, did I put MI here? Yeah, I did. Okay, so the holonomy groups are of the type SU here. And for these guys are the derivative of the type SP, which means these are hyperkalers, right? Because the holonomy is SP of something. So that's the description of the universal cover. And then the second part says something about M itself. So there exists a finite et al cover
uh, let's say M prime of M isomorphic to a product T times the product again of the same VIs and then the product of the same XJs where now T is a complex torus. Okay, so um, so this this gives you a complete complete description, right, of compact uh, Kähler uh, Ricci Ricci flat manifold, right? So um, you can see now also you can see also what happens with what the holonomy group of such a manifold. What are the possibilities for the holonomy groups, right? Because you know the holonomy groups of these factors. Um, you know that T has holonomy group zero, and then the VIs have holonomy group. Uh, SU of MI and XJs have got SP of RJ. Okay, so this is our um, so this is our description, right? And uh, so from now on, then so so if you have uh, so this is the description of these manifolds. So the the next the for the rest of these lectures, I'm going to concentrate on these uh, hyperkähler manifolds, right? Which are the ones with holonomy SP of R for some R, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, describe some, some things about them. Are there any questions before I uh, switch gears and get into uh, hyperkähler manifolds more? Okay, all right. And I have got another maybe 10 minutes or something. Okay, all right. All right, so the first thing about um, hyperkähler manifolds, right? So, hyperkähler manifolds are, are what we call holomorphic symplectic. Okay, so what does that mean? It means the following. It means that suppose um, that you have a manifold Mij, um, compact Kähler, and simply connected. And Ricci flat of dimension two R with uh, now the dimension here two R over the complex numbers. Okay, before before we were talking that about the dimension over the real numbers. Now from now on, our dimensions will be over the complex numbers because everything is going to be a complex manifold. So over C and with holonomy group. Um, SP of R, okay? So suppose that we have these things, then we have the following conclusions. Number one, there exists a holomorphic two form phi on M, which is non-degenerate everywhere. What do we mean by that? We mean that it's non-degenerate non as a map um, uh, from, um, uh, let's see, as a map from, uh, uh, it's a two form, so sorry, uh, it's as a map from TM to TM dual, okay? So, um, <clears throat> right, so basically this, this holomorphic two form, what it means is that basically phi gives you a, an isomorphism 
between TM and I will write it now as omega one because that's the holomorphic cotangent bundle, okay? So phi case basically gives you, uh, gives you an isomorphism between the, 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 comp the holomorphic tangent bundle and then it's dual. So that's what we mean by phi being non-degenerate, right? So there is just a holomorphic two form like this and it's, it's unique up to multiplication by a scalar. by a complex number uh, scalar, right? And then number two is for all P between zero and the dimension, H zero of M omega two P plus M, two P plus one of M is zero and H zero of M omega two P of M is equal to C times phi to the P. I suppose actually the uniqueness is contained in the second statement, right? Um, so, uh, right. So this is kind of nice. So this is what we mean by being holomorphic symplectic, which means that we have a holomorphic two form, which is everywhere non-degenerate. And, um, and people, you know, even have, let me give you actually the definition. So a smooth, complex analytic manifold. Uh, let me just say then a complex manifold. So a complex manifold is called holomorphic symplectic if there exists a phi from TM to Omega one M holomorphic two form. So an everywhere non degenerate holomorphic two form. Okay. Um, if uh, so, let me call this M again as usual. M is called irreducible. if this phi is unique up to multiplication by a scalar. Okay. All right. Uh, do I have more time? Uh, how much more time have I got? Um, In theory, a couple of minutes, but you can... Oh. Okay, all right. Um, well, um, well, actually now I wanna do examples. So uh, let me, maybe I can just say something about the case of surfaces and then we can do the other examples tomorrow. So, okay, so examples. Um, so for instance, surfaces. Well, for surfaces, what do we have? Well, you have that SP1 is actually equal to SU2. Okay. And um, so, so this was, this was the hyperkähler case. And this one was the Calabiao case. So what does this mean? So this means that the hyperkähler in this case is equal to Calabiao. And what are these guys? So these are K3 surfaces. So these are, we have K3 surfaces. Well, these are the irreducible holomorphic symplectic ones, right? But then you have, so these are the ones where, whose holonomy is actually equal to SP1 or SU2. But then you, we also have complex tori, of course. And that's it. So that's all we've got. So in dimension two, we just have K3 surfaces and complex tori. And what's a K3 surface, right? Let me just give the definition of the K3 surface and then I'll stop. A K3 surface is 
a compact complex manifold of dimension two, such that omega two x, the holomorphic, the, the, the vector bundle of holomorphic two forms is isomorphic to O, it's trivial. And H1 of X O X is zero. Okay. So one can so if you if you just make the definition like this, you can you can prove a lot of things. You can prove that these are these these are simply connected. You can prove that their integral cohomology is torsion free. These are not too difficult. And then you can prove that they are Kähler. This one is hard. Okay. Uh, in a unique way. Uh, with a, with a unique, actually, what, what do I mean by unique way? Um, remember, these are all uh, hyperkehler, so they have lots of Kähler structures, but they have a unique Kähler metric. So the metric is unique, the complex structures are not. Right, so for each Kähler metric, you have a sphere of complex structures, right, that are Kähler for that metric, but, um, uh, but once you, if you fix the complex structure, you have a unique Kähler metric. So there, there's only one, yeah, one Kähler metric. And uh, all right, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give examples of K3 surfaces and then I'll, I'll stop. So the easiest examples of K3 surfaces, you can do uh, double covers of P2 branched along. Smooth sextics. Uh, you can do a smooth cortex in P3. Uh, you can do two, three complete intersections. in P4, and then you can do two, two, two complete intersections in P5. And these are, these are, uh, these are the easy ones. And after this, uh, it's gonna get a little bit more complicated. Okay, so I will stop here. Sorry for having gone over a little bit. Thank you. Thank you.